Hello, everybody. Welcome to our town hall, Fighting for Justice in Iowa. I'm Misty Rebick. I'll be moderating the event today. Thank you for joining us. You know, I also had the honor to help lead our team in Iowa uh, with Bernie's campaign. So it feels so great to be back with folks in my home state um, and to be here with you. Um, as you're joining our event, uh, you can use the chat feature down here at the bottom of the screen. And you can click down there and I would love for you to say hello. Um, you can say where you're from, what county you're from, what city you're from, and I'll give some shout outs to all the people from Iowa joining us right now. Uh, welcome again to our Fighting for Justice in Iowa Town Hall. And to those of you joining us from all across the country, thank you so much. Um, we're going to kick off our, our town hall today with a short video produced by Team Bernie to really hone in on what's been happening on the ground in Iowa. So let's take a look at that video. Tonight, across Cedar Rapids, Iowa, the need is still great. Hurricane force winds of up to 130 miles an hour. The damages statewide are in the billions. Tens of thousands are still without power. And in Cedar Rapids, some are living in tents. And the farmers, a full one third of their state's crop destroyed. I'm here in our emergency operations center uh, that is filled with women and men who are working around the clock uh, to keep our community safe. The weather struck fast and right before what was supposed to be a great corn harvest, leaving behind hurricane-like aftermath. High volume nail sorting machines are apparently being dismantled, including the machine at the Waterloo Post Office. Mail is beginning to pile up in our offices and we're seeing equipment being removed. Many hope the first wave of COVID infections were over by now, but states like Iowa are seeing some of their highest numbers in months. Here in the heartland, one thing there's a bounty of is resilience. Tonight, across Iowa, they are standing strong. Are you watching the video? I'm monitoring our live stream I'm not watching okay. So thank you everybody for joining our town hall, fighting for justice in Iowa. We have folks from all over the state joining us right now. We have Jenny from Iowa City. We have Jason Snell from the Sunrise Movement in Cedar Rapids. Welcome. We've got Pat and Ken Bowen, uh, Iowa CCI Action Fund members from Iowa City, Johnson County. We've got Evan Berger from Slater, Iowa joining. Um, as you're joining our event today, please feel free to use the chat feature down at the bottom. You'll be able to communicate with each other as we get into our event. And then also there's going to be an opportunity uh, to ask questions of all of our panelists. And in order to ask questions during our town hall today, you will use the Q&A button down at the bottom of your screen. Uh, when you submit a question, we ask that you give your name, what city or county you're from, and you know, ask us a question about something that you've heard about today. Um, again, would love to hear from where you're from in Iowa. And to those of you joining us all across the country, thank you so much for tuning in to hear from folks on the ground in Iowa about what's happening right now and what we need to do. So first, um, I am so excited to introduce our first guest. She's an Iowa native. She serves on the board of directors for Iowa CCI Action Fund and is one of the many community activists who helped to lead the fight uh, to, to raise the minimum wage in Johnson County uh, just a few years ago. So please help me welcome a good friend of mine and amazing activist, Katie Beekler. Hi, Missy, thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, like Misty said, my name is Katie Beekler and I'm a member of Iowa CCI Action Fund. At CCI, we've been working for 45 years to fight for the Iowa and the world we deserve by working for climate, racial, worker, and immigration justice, just to name a few. The fight for justice as we know it has existed since the inception of our nation. We've had wins and we've had losses, but the last four years have highlighted the deep-seated ways in which everyday people have been disenfranchised and left behind by a system that wasn't built for us. This year, as COVID-19 continues to rage through our country, President Trump has done nothing to mitigate the crises so many people are facing. Senators Joni Ernst and Chuck Grassley and Governor Kim Reynolds have followed his lead in Iowa, leaving millions of us without guidance and safety nets in the middle of a pandemic and an economic crisis. Now, as our state is still reeling from a derecho, which is a storm akin to a category four hurricane, that hit us nearly two weeks ago and has left thousands without power and water, we know we cannot look to our governor, senators, or president for the help we need. We instead have to organize and strategize with one another 
and with allies across the country for the future we deserve. That's why I'm honored to have with us today someone who has continued to prove himself a champion for working people, Senator Bernie Sanders. Katie, thank you very much uh, for the introduction and for all the great work you're doing. Uh, and Misty, thank you for helping to organize this event. And let me thank the people of Iowa. Um, during a presidential campaign under Misty's leadership, uh, we spent more time in Iowa probably than uh, any state in the country. We went to a whole lot of very small towns and we were in Des Moines and we were in Cedar Rapids and the larger cities as well. And I just want to thank the people of Iowa for their incredible hospitality, for their willingness to come up and speak truth to power, and to thank you for the fact that we ended up winning um, the popular vote in that state. Um, what today is about uh, is doing what happens too rarely, I think, and that is just talking about the reality facing working people in this country. Uh, and in Iowa, not only do we have the derecho and the devastation that has taken place in Cedar Rapids uh, and neighboring communities, but we have the pandemic, which has claimed over 170,000 lives throughout the United States, and the rejection of science on the part of the Trump administration, which has made a bad situation much worse. There are doctors and nurses today unbelievably, five months after the pandemic hit us, who still do not have the nurses, the uh, masks and the gloves and the gowns they need to protect themselves and to do what has to be done to help us. Uh, and in the midst of the pandemic, we have also had a, an economic meltdown unprecedented since the Great Depression of the 1930s. And we're looking at tens of millions of people who have lost their jobs, no income is coming in. People are finding it hard to feed their kids. Uh, they have no health insurance. Uh, they're worried about getting evicted from their apartments uh, or their homes. They can't pay their bills. Uh, and that's what's going on in terms of the economy today in Iowa, in Vermont, and all across this country. And as a United States Senator, I got to tell you, I have fought very, very hard to make certain that we continue to see unemployed workers receive that $600 uh, supplement to their unemployment insurance. And many of you who may be watching were receiving that 600 bucks. But we couldn't get Mitch McConnell and the Republican Senate to move. They essentially turned their backs on working people. Trump has come up with some $300 plan, which will maybe go on for a few weeks. Some states will go into it, some states will not but it is a totally ineffectual approach given the crises that we face. And I want you to take a look at your United States Senator today, Joni Ernst, and ask what role she has played in allowing Mitch McConnell not to bring forth serious legislation that not only would have allowed us to extend that $600 supplement, but provide a monthly check for every worker. You all recall, many of you received a $1,200 a stimulus check. Well, some of us wanted it to be higher and some of us wanted to extend it, but we didn't get that. Some of you who are watching this have absolutely no health insurance because of our dysfunctional healthcare system where health care is tied to your job. When you lose your job, you lose your health care. Well, some of us want to make sure that you continue to receive your health insurance by during this crisis, expanding Medicare to cover all of the uninsured and, and the underinsured. And many of you are worried about maybe being evicted or foreclosures on your house. Well, we wanted to extend uh, eviction protection, uh, but none of that happened because we could not get the Republicans in the Senate to do what the Democratic leadership in the House did. Some four months ago, Democrats passed a bill called the Heroes Bill, which didn't do everything I wanted it to do, but it was a serious step forward in protecting working people during this crisis. Republican leadership, Republicans in the Senate, nothing at all. And we are where we are as a result. But what I want to also say is that as this campaign uh, gets underway, um, you know, with Biden having accepted the Democratic nomination, uh, Trump getting the Republican nomination in the coming weeks, I want you to all 
stay focused on the important issues facing working families. And the day after Biden is elected, I and progressive movement throughout this country is gonna do everything that we can to make sure that we have a government that represents all of us and not just the wealthy few. And what does that mean? It means that we have got to raise the minimum wage in this country to a living wage. I was throughout Iowa and I was talking to moms and dads trying to make it on 10, 11 bucks an hour. You can't do it. If you work 40 hours a week in America, you should not be living in poverty. We've got to raise that minimum wage to $15 an hour. And that's what Joe Biden, by the way, believes in. I've talked to many trade unionists in the state of Iowa, and we're going to have some on this program today. And there are workers out there who want to join unions, but can't because of corporate uh, opposition, often illegal opposition. We want to make it easier for workers to join unions. We believe in equal pay for equal work. Women should not be making 80 cents on the dollar. We know that when we have a crumbling infrastructure in Iowa, in Vermont, and all over this, uh, this country, that's our roads, our bridges, water systems, wastewater plants, affordable housing, we can put millions of people to work at good paying jobs. That's what Biden believes. That's what I believe. We know and we believe that all of our kids should be able to get a higher education without going deeply into debt. That's why we got to make public colleges, universities tuition free, in my view, my view, cancel all student debt. At a time of massive income and wealth inequality, where the rich are becoming so much richer, where three people now own more wealth than the bottom half of America, where big money controls the political process, we need to deal with income and wealth inequality. We may need to demand that the wealthiest people stop paying their fair share of taxes. We need to deal with criminal justice reform and police department reform so that we don't have more people in jail disproportionately, African-American, Latino, Native American than any other country on earth. We need to deal with immigration reform so that we move toward comprehensive immigration reform and a path toward citizenship for the undocumented in this country. And we need to move toward climate change. All of you are aware, it's not only derecho in Iowa, you are aware of what's going on in California right now, where they're having terrible, terrible fires. These extreme weather disturbances and forest fires and the warming of the oceans and drought and flooding ain't gonna get any better unless as a planet under American leadership, we transform our energy system away from fossil fuel to energy efficiency. And when we do those things, we can create millions of good paying jobs. So there is an enormous amount of work to be done short term. We have to address the crises that working families are facing today as a result of the pandemic. And that is to demand that Trump and the Republican leadership in the Senate, Joni Ernst and all those folks start responding to the crisis that's out there. Longer term, we gotta work in so many ways to create a government that works for all and not just the few. Healthcare, among other things, is a human right. We should not have over 90 million Americans, including many in Iowa. My God, the stories that I heard when I went around Iowa, where people lost loved ones because they couldn't afford the outrageously high price of prescription drugs. People didn't have access to the healthcare they need. People went bankrupt because of medical debt. That is a dysfunctional system and we have to move toward Medicare for all. So there is an enormous amount of work to be done, but what you know and what our panelists know and what I know, none of that is gonna get done unless ordinary people stand up for justice, stand up and say, hey, you know what? I want a government that represents me and my children and my parents, not just the very, very rich. And that's what that's what our movement is about. And that's why we have got to elect a Joe Biden, why we've got to defeat Donald Trump and why we need to retain a democratic house and we need to uh, develop and, 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 and create a democratic Senate as well. So uh, with that, let me again, thank all of you for watching. Let me thank uh, our panelists. We have a great group of panelists today. Let me thank the guy I'm gonna introduce next, uh, Stacy Walker is a supervisor uh, in Lynn County. Uh, Stacy played a very, very active role in our campaign, and I thank him very much for that. 
And I was so impressed by Stacey and, and the work that he did that when Joe Biden and I put together six task forces to deal with some of the major issues uh, facing our country, and we had representation and his campaign did, uh, Stacey was one of our representatives on the criminal justice uh, task force, and I thank him for that as well. So without further ado, let me uh, introduce Stacey Walker, uh, Lynn County Supervisor. Thank you so much, uh, Senator Sanders, uh, for hosting these virtual forums with activists and working people and policymakers and community leaders around the country. And uh, thanks for thinking about Iowa uh, during this tough time. It was an honor to serve as a co-chair of your campaign here in Iowa. And I did notice that uh, uh, Black Hawk County Supervisor Chris Schwartz is joining us uh, on this virtual uh, forum as well. He was also uh, an Iowa co-chair. And I do appreciate the opportunity to serve on the Criminal uh, Justice Reform Task Force. And I look forward to uh, what we will uh, continue to accomplish as we move forward as the progressive movement uh, moves forward in America and it continues to evolve and grow stronger uh, by the day. So what I wanna do before I move to our next uh, guest is just give you a quick rundown of uh, the situation uh, here in Iowa, especially uh, Eastern Iowa, Lynn County, uh, which was the hardest hit area by the derecho storm. So we had this storm um, on Monday uh, last week, and uh, this storm reached a wind speed of 140 miles per hour. And as Katie was saying earlier in the program, uh, that would qualify as a category four hurricane. Uh, this uh, weather event impacted the entire state. And it, uh, um, without a doubt, is one of the worst natural disasters uh, in the history of this state. So Lynn County, the county I represent, um, is the second largest county in the state of Iowa. And over 90% of our residents lost power. Many were without cellular or internet service for days. There have been human casualties as a result of this extreme weather event. And uh, um, everybody is uh, impacted and everyone is hurting. Um, I will say as an elected official, it was troubling. Um, uh, our, our, our sort of state and federal government response has been troubling. And that's why I want to thank the Senator for pulling this together um, uh, to bring attention to this event, but also to put a little pressure on uh, folks in our federal government. Um, our Senator Joni Ernst, I have not heard from her again. Uh, this is, uh, I represent the second largest county, the hardest hit county. Uh, and quite honestly, um, you know, our governor spent the first few days of this crisis uh, campaigning with um, uh, Vice President Trump. And as we know, uh, President Trump was recently here in Iowa. Um, he uh, visited, I guess, to get a better understanding of the disaster, but was, uh, for whatever reason, unable to leave the airport where he held a meeting with uh, Republican candidates for office. Um, no Democrats were invited and people who actually have a pretty good working knowledge of the event were not invited. And after spending about 30, 40 minutes uh, talking with these folks, he boarded Air Force One and, and he took off and went somewhere else. So I think a lot of Iowans are really uh, upset at the uh, state and federal government response and, and we could really use a lot of help. We do know that uh, minority neighborhoods and low income communities were uh, especially hit the hardest. And we obviously know that those neighborhoods are gonna have a harder time rebounding. We do know that this is a crisis within a crisis as we are dealing with spiking COVID numbers here. Um, also an economic downturn, um, primarily caused by uh, the COVID pandemic. And now we've got this natural disaster. And so uh, before I, I get to our next featured guest who will bring um, a, a much needed perspective to this conversation, I wanna say a word about the way uh, folks uh, can help us. So if you are spread across the country and you're watching this, uh, certainly there are the larger institutional organizations you can support, the Red Cross, United Way, um, but there are also organizations that are on the ground here that have a justice focus, that have responded in a way that in my view um, has outshined and outpaced that of much larger organizations. Um, and, and, and the organization that comes to mind, and I'm wearing their shirt to plug them, it's the Advocates for Social Justice. 
They're the Black Lives Matter affiliate group um, that, again, has been more effective than some national relief organizations. Um, so we'll share their information uh, throughout this broadcast so that you can learn how to support them. The other thing I want you to do is keep putting this story in the news. I want you to talk about it and, and try to draw some national attention and put pressure on Senator Joni Ernst and President Trump to act in a meaningful way and keep turning out to elect progressives up and down the ballot so that we can get a Green New Deal and we can get um, um, you know, universal health care and all of the things that are going to help working people. As Senator Sanders um, um, mentioned, we've got devastating wildfires in California. We've got derechos hitting the Midwest. And I read this morning that there are two hurricanes headed toward the Gulf of Mexico right now, and they're expected to hit at exactly the same time. Um, this is serious stuff. And uh, progressive politicians are um, going to bring about the policies that we need uh, to address this in a meaningful way. Now, with that said, I have the honor and privilege of introducing a dear friend of mine. Her name is Kathy Glosson. She's a registered nurse. She's president of SEIU Local 199. She's a former gubernatorial candidate. She was born and raised here in Spencer, Iowa. She worked for over 20 years as a nurse uh, and currently serves in the SEIU International Executive Board, the National Nurse Alliance Leadership Committee, and is also president of SEIU Iowa, which represents over 5,000 hardworking Iowans in the eastern half of the state. In 2018, Kathy entered the Democratic primary race for governor and garnered nearly 40,000 votes as a runner-up and had a wonderful campaign manager uh, in that exciting race as well. So with no further ado, I'd bring to you all Kathy Glossom. Great. Thank you so much, Stacy. Really appreciate it. And good morning, everyone. I'm just really thrilled to be here with you this morning. Uh, and I want to thank Senator Sanders for hosting this extremely important event where we bring everyday people together, not just to talk about the issues, but to mobilize and energize people around the things that we care about. Uh, issues that are literally hurting and causing Iowans and Americans to unnecessarily die at this moment in our history. You know, Stacy just shared um, extremely important information about the, the major devastation from uh, the storms we experienced here called the derecho. And it just highlights the tremendous failure of the Trump administration and our own senators Grassley and Ernst and our governor and how they responded or failed to respond rapidly enough for one of the worst disasters in recent memory. You know, as Iowans work to overcome this natural disaster and we're pulling together to do that, there yet remains a lingering disaster, which is our government's response to the COVID-19 pandemic, both at the state and federal levels. Iowa has some of the highest per capita COVID infections in this country. And we've reached a grim milestone just this, this just on Thursday this week, where we encountered over a thousand deaths of our fellow Iowans and the cases continue to climb and the deaths continue to climb. This is unacceptable. I wanna call out our governor and the Iowa Department of Public Health around their blatant lack of transparency and their failure in reporting accurate public health data to Iowans. If one thing is true, it's the fact that COVID-19 has pulled back the curtain and exposed the underlying racial, economic, climate and healthcare crisis that we've been facing for decades and even centuries. It's exposed the lack of preparedness of our hospitals right here in Iowa at the time when nurses needed PPE the most and were crying out because they had lack of adequate personal protective equipment like masks, gowns, and gloves. The nurses and frontline healthcare workers were told to reuse N95 respirators, the masks used when you're working directly with a COVID patient. They're only intended to be used once. We saw nurses and respiratory care therapists who had uh, underlying health conditions of their own like cancer, who were told to report to work in COVID units. And nurses were re told to report to work even though they could work from home remotely and had no patients in their clinic to see. Republicans who control both our state and federal government have succeeded in putting more lives at risk than ever before in our country. And I'm talking specifically about Iowa meatpacker workers, frontline essential workers, 
like school custodians, grocery workers, fast food workers, nurses, nursing home workers, childcare workers, and now teachers, students, and essentially each of our communities. You know, at the University of Iowa hospitals and clinics where we represent over almost 4,000 nurses and healthcare professionals, the COVID units are full. And yet schools and our universities are being forced to reopen in-person classes. Being a nurse at a time when our elected officials aren't listening or don't care has resulted in healthcare workers having to make the extremely difficult decision of whether to leave their job or risk their own health and their, that of their families. They worry that given the trend of the increasing cases, that they'll continue to see increased infection rates that would ultimately overwhelm our healthcare system and the supplies that we need to protect ourselves. So what are we and what can we do about it? Well, our union represents those thousands of workers in Iowa um, and Head Start teachers, public school uh, workers. And we're partnering with other unions in the state and other progressive organizations like Iowa Citizens for Community Improvement. We're working with the climate movement, the Black Lives Movement, to amplify our voices and fight back and talk truth to power. Together, we're demanding state, state and statewide mask requirements, local control over decisions that affect our own lives, and demanding that both employers and government protect all workers by ensuring they receive hazard pay when they're essential workers, provided safe and effective PPE and lasting economic relief in the form of universal health care. Yes, Medicare for all. We need a $15 minimum wage and unions for all and ongoing financial support. So for so many Iowans and their families who are struggling or are still out of work. So we're gonna be in the streets and on the news and we're gonna continue to be in the streets and on the news. We need to organize and mobilize to ensure that we have a government that actually cares about its people instead of one that caters to the wealthy corporations and the donors who currently are pulling the strings in Des Moines and DC. SEIU Iowa, along with our partners, will continue to fight to ensure that our communities and all workers are protected because we all should be able to live the American dream. But it's up to each of us to make sure that we commit to vote in November. We need to get our family, our friends and our neighbors out to vote because we need to replace Donald Trump, Senator Joni Ernst and down ballot candidates who we know will always choose profits over people. And I know this because when we vote, we win. When we fight, we win. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Kathy, for, for that. We really appreciate having you on this program. I'd next like to introduce Larry Ginter. Larry is a farmer and Iowa CCI Action member. Larry is a third generation farmer from Rhodes, Iowa. He's lived his entire life on the family farm he grew up on besides his two years of service in the armed forces. Larry has been fighting for worker, environmental, and family farm justice since 1965. With no further ado, I bring to you Larry Ginter. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you, Senator Sanders, for holding this important meeting today. My name is Larry Ginter, a third generation family farmer and a member of Iowa CCI Action. The great show that swept across Iowa two weeks ago was a natural disaster, the likes of which I've never seen in all my years of farming. People's homes, their farms, and their communities are hurting. I just got my power back Wednesday night, but thousands are still without. Our crops are laid flat. It was nearly half the state's farmland impacted by 100 mile hour power wind. Homes, grain bins, barns, elevators, and more were damaged, with pieces of these buildings out in the fields. They may not know the full damage until harvest, but it's already expected to be over $4 billion in damage. This it comes on top of the drought, the public health pandemic we're all fighting. We need help out here. We're holding together to help our communities, but it's going to take more. It's going to take a massive investment in people and communities and our livelihoods. Just like the unemployed need a halt on home for clothing, no family farmer should lose a farm from this disaster or pandemic need a halt on farm foreclosures. But what we definitely don't need is another handout to giant agribusiness corporations. But the truth is, this superstorm was just a straw that put the camel's back. We've been hurting since the farm crisis of the 1980s. Hell, we've been hurting since 1953 when policy makers responded to corporate agribusiness interests 
attacked the family farm by rolling back vital programs and favoring donkey farm capitalism. As a result, we've lost tens of thousands of family farms in rural communities. And this industrial system of farming also means we're losing our soil, including our water. We've, what we've seen for the last 67 years, market and environmental deregulation, NAFTA, policies allowing corporate farming and corporate ownership of livestock. We've had grain prices that don't even cover the cost of production, forcing farmers to take more and more on debt. And now we're in the midst of Trump's trade war with China. We can't take any more of this, and we know what the solutions are. The big solution we need to fight for is a Green New Deal. We need to restore economic dignity to workers and farmers. We need a price at the farm gate that reflects true cost reduction plus family living expenses. And we need a living wage for all workers. We need a farmer-owned grain reserve and a supply management program to be able to weather things like the drought and ranch oil that we've seen this year. We've laid out these ideas in People's Action Will Agenda, which I encourage everyone to look at. But we're not going to get any of this unless we fight for the progressive agenda. We need to take on Trump and the Trump of cronies and his bullies he works with and take on the politics of division. Farmers, workers, students and teachers and caregivers, all of us live this struggle together. That's why I'm glad you're here with us today, Senator Sanders, because we have a big fight on our hands. That's going to take all of us working together to get it done. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that, Larry. I'd next uh, like to introduce uh, Bridget Williams. She's a leader of the Sunrise Movement of Cedar Rapids and a coordinator for a local food pantry and food delivery program for homebound residents. And I believe uh, Bridget has recently partnered with the Advocates uh, for Social Justice to further this mission in particular. Bridget has developed climate resolutions for the city of Cedar Rapids and has worked um, uh, extensively with uh, Lynn County government on climate goals as well. And she uh, is currently working to provide foods to residents during the COVID-19 pandemic and the aftermath of the derecho storm. Uh, Bridget Williams is one of the the best organizers I've had the chance to meet in this state, and I am incredibly excited to see uh, what she will do next. So I bring to you all Bridget Williams. Um, thank you so much, Stacey. Um, my name is Bridget Williams. Like Stacy said, I'm a leader of Sunrise Movement Cedar Rapids, and I run a local food pantry. However, since the derecho storm, my role has transformed to include um, program directing, volunteer coordinating, emotional support, fundraising, client intake, delivering and shopping for food and connecting residents with resources. And I'm not alone. Many in my community have taken on greater roles to respond to the derecho storm, which has intensified the COVID-19 pandemic and underlying problems of racism and wealth inequality in our county. Residents and community organizations have been working nonstop for the past two weeks. We are tired and we are emotionally spent. It is critical for communities across America and the globe to understand how this happened and how their governments can better prepare for future crises. The aftermath of the derecho storm here in Iowa was not just lights off and trees down. Landlords and management companies abandoned their tenants. Public transit shut down. Houses, cars, and buildings were demolished, totaled. People with medical conditions were unable to keep their oxygen on and their insulin cold. Residents were displaced. Food pantries lost refrigeration capabilities or suffered damages and could not open. There were no predetermined resource sites for people to go to when they lost internet and cell service. There was confusion amongst representatives as to what the National Guard does and what support they, we could receive. A disaster was not declared by our governor until a week after the storm. The inaction of Republican leadership and lack of city preparation forced city organizations and individuals like myself to step up for low-income, disabled, elderly, and refugees um, in our community. Residents already affected by COVID-19, having lost their jobs and now unable to leave their homes, are now facing an even larger crisis. This is the climate crisis, a never-ending crisis for low-income, disabled, elderly, and black and brown communities, a never-ending battle for individuals on the ground. Climate refugees in your own neighborhood, medical emergencies, food insecurity, deaths, this will happen to your city and it will happen to mine again. We must be prepared. As leader of Sunrise Cedar Rapids, I have created two climate resolutions for my city and county, committing my community to cut emissions and prioritize disaster infrastructure for low-income residents. We must now push our officials to act. 
It is evident to me now that we do not have time for a year long planning process for task forces and committees and surveys. My community is hungry and displaced and we were unprepared. It is time for every individual to organize and push their governments at every level to action, to pass Green New Deals, to cut carbon in half, to transition workers to clean energy, to put black indigenous communities of color at the forefront of decision-making and to create disaster response plans. When I talk about the climate crisis, I'm not talking about some far away melting ice cap. I'm talking about the devastation of my own community, people waiting in line for food and supplies, people crying to me on the phone about the destruction of their home, people needing food, not just for themselves, but for a motel of a hundred people. The climate crisis has become personal to me. It is time for government officials to be brave and to be bold, to be prepared for disasters like the one taking place in my city, so that when the power goes out and the trees come down, we can still see a road ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much for that powerful uh, statement, Bridget. We really appreciate it. And the last featured guest on our program is Mike Bates. Mike is the president of APWU Local 44, Des Moines, uh, and he is from the Des Moines area. He's been a postal worker for 27 years and he's been active uh, in the union for 18 years. Uh, and he has been president of APWU Local 44 for six years. And he doesn't know this now, but I will be submitting his name to future president uh, Biden uh, for uh, the postmaster general position. So with no further ado, I bring to you all Mike Bates. Thank you so much, Stacey. Uh, thank you, Senator Sanders, for putting this on. Uh, I love all the guest speakers that you have today. They have so much to bring to the table. Um, I would like to talk about the Postal Service right now, and it's under attack. I think it's a tragedy that um, President Trump has politicized the pandemic, and now he's politicizing uh, mail-in votes. I think, I think it's just ridiculous. The Postal Service is enshrined in the Constitution to deliver prompt, reliable mail services. My group takes very good pride in moving the mail. Um, right now, the Postmaster General uh, is trying to destroy us from within. We are essential workers that are going to work every day. We're, put, we're, put, we're putting uh, everything together, uh, delivering the mail through a pandemic, through a storm that I've never seen the likes of here in Iowa. Um, and we take pride in that. Um, we deliver, we process the mail 365 days a year, 24 seven. Um, the president and the PMG are trying to undermine mail-in ballots. The, the good thing that Iowa has is the way that we vote. Um, you can vote the day of, you can vote in person 30 days in advance, and then you can absentee ballot. We have the capability and the capacity to deliver those ballots. We treat them like our own. What I've been telling people, I think where you're gonna see a big influx in, in mail-in ballots. I think that you need to mail them in as quickly as possible. As soon as you know who you're voting for, and I hope you're voting for blue. Um, the Postal Service has a 91% favorability, better than any other government agencies. Uh, the Postal Service operates on zero taxpayer dollars. We employ 20, 21% African Americans, 11% minorities other than African Americans, 18% veterans, and over 40% women we don't just earn 80, to 80 cents to the buck, they earn the full buck. These jobs bring these groups of workers out of poverty, gives them a living wage, good health care, and it gives their children a better education because they can afford it. I, they did not know how much the public loves the Postal Service. When Trump started his attacks on the post office, he didn't realize, neither did the PMG, didn't realize the groups and the public outcry to protect the people's post office. 
We're asking for COVID relief of $25 billion. The CARES Act, we were in the CARES Act. President Trump said, if that's gonna be in the CARES Act, we're not gonna, we're not gonna fund it, we're not gonna do it. So while other businesses got bailed out, the Postal Service got sold out. We also need to repeal the Postal Accountability Enhancement Act that makes us pre-fund our health, health retirees uh, 75 years in advance. $5.5 billion a year, it's just ridiculous. We need to stop the cuts that they're making right now. They're taking out 671 delivery barcode sorters that sorts 36,000 pieces an hour and taking out blue boxes from communities and they're trying to destroy the postal service. We believe that rural broadband needs uh, protect. We, we're looking at making the postal service a hotspot for rural broadband um, and make those communities thrive in rural, rural Iowa. We're also looking at postal banking so we can get rid of these loan shark uh, places of checking the cash, feeding on the poor, the working poor, mind you. Um, we're also looking at putting uh, charging stations for electric cars and post offices. And those are just some of the ideas that we have, but we believe that cutting, cutting is not the answer, but to expand services is the answer. These jobs are good union jobs for Iowans and for the people across this country. We deliver 40% uh, of FedEx's mail and UPS's mail down into little, little towns in Iowa. We deliver farm equipment to the farmer <coughs> and we deliver uh, medicines to our veterans. That's very important. And to delay that and to deny that and to privatize that, it would just be a tragedy. Thank you for having us on. Uh, we really appreciate the support that the uh, Iowans have been giving us. Uh, and thank you, Senator Sanders, for all the work that you did. Uh, I, I'm proud that my local was the first local to endorse you in Iowa in 2016. And uh, I, just keep up the good work, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. We appreciate everybody on the panel. We're going to jump to some questions from Iowans. We've had lots of people join uh, since we started the show today. We've got people from Fairfield, Davenport, Muscatine, Ankeny. Shout out to all those Iowans joining us. Thank you so much. So the first question is from Sherry Hawk in Ankeny. Sherry asks, what's the best route to move Biden and Harris towards supporting Medicare for all? Senator, do you want to take that one? Sure. Um, as Kathy mentioned earlier, uh, if we look at our healthcare system today, it is hard not to appreciate that it is cruel, wasteful, and dysfunctional. We are spending almost twice as much per capita as countries around the world, and yet we are the only major country that doesn't have health care for all of our people. Today, over 90 million people are uninsured or underinsured. In some cases, we are paying 10 times more for prescription drugs as do the Canadians or people in other countries. So the function of a rational, humane healthcare system is not to make billions in profits for the drug companies and the insurance companies. It is to provide quality care for all people. That's my view, that is the view of I think virtually all of our panelists and many millions of Americans who today understand the insanity of a system where your health care is tied to your job, you lose your job, you lose your health care. Now, Biden's view is not my view. Uh, he wants to create a public option. He wants to make health care more accessible to people. He has some pretty strong provisions to lower the cost of prescription drugs. But he is not a supporter of Medicare for all. So I think what we have got to do after Biden is elected is rally the American people to take on the power and the greed of the healthcare industry, which every year makes tens and tens of billions of dollars. This really is not a healthcare issue. 
It is a political issue and an economic issue. Healthcare industry spends a fortune on lobbying and campaign contributions, both the Republicans and Democrats. And the way we beat them is when millions of people stand up and say, you know what? Healthcare is a human right, not a job benefit. Every American should be able to afford the prescription drugs they need and not have the absurd situation where one out of five cannot fill their doctors, the prescription their doctors write. So to answer your question, we need people to stand up. And the good news is that more and more people understand that the current healthcare system is so cruel. We lose about 60,000 people a year who don't go to a doctor when they should. We have the momentum. And now the job is to take on the very powerful, well-financed special interests who run the healthcare industry. When we do that, we're gonna win. We're gonna win this fight, absolutely. Just the question is whether it is sooner or later. Let us make it sooner. The next question comes from Ava, and Ava's asking to Larry and anybody else who wants to chime in, but specifically Larry, can you say more about why bailouts don't help independent family farmers? Well, sure. A bailout just doesn't settle the price of, settle the, the, the position of price at the farm gate. I mean, we've been getting these subsidies that never have really matched what would be a fair price of family living expenses. It just keeps farmers producing and producing and producing cheaper grain all the time. And we need a fair price out here for family farmers. I think it's like a thousand times a fair price for family farmers and a living wage for workers. That is a key economic battlefield that we need to keep playing all along. This is the only way we're going to solve the economic inequalities. Fair price for farmers and a living wage for workers. And the subsidies don't do the job. We need a price out here at the farm gate. Great, thank you, Larry. Um, we have another question. This is related to climate change. What are the solutions that not just focus on the most immediate derecho that's happened here in Cedar Rapids, but the long-term solutions for the hardest hit? Yeah, I think um, Tracy can probably speak to this as well, but I think a lot of community organizers um, and agencies are starting to think about this and are trying to determine what the long-term need is. Um, because even though people's power is coming back on, we're seeing that people um, are still without food, essential items. Um, some people have been displaced from their apartment complexes. Uh, so there are two parts of this. There's number one, the climate action part of this, which is the best way to ensure that we are supporting our residents is to try to make sure this doesn't happen again. Um, it will happen again, but in order to um, mitigate the climate crisis, it is important that cities and communities across America um, make a significant effort to um, cut emissions um, and prepare for disasters. The other part of this is meeting the needs that people have right here on the ground. Um, and I think that um, because individuals like myself and um, grassroots organizations have been doing the work, um, it's time for the city to come to us and to work with us um, because we're the ones who are in connection with the person who's basically running the show at their apartment complex because their landlord is gone. Um, we're the ones who are on the ground seeing what the needs are. So I think the first step is to um, is for the city to bring us on um, and discuss the needs that we're seeing. I also think there is a need for much more long-term social services and resource centers um, in every neighborhood in our city, both in the case of a disaster and also in the case of right now during COVID-19 where people are kind of in a constant crisis of need. I, I, I wanna jump in here if I can as well. Bridget is absolutely correct. There are uh, uh, two parts of this crisis. There's the the uh, climate action part, which he articulated uh, so well, and other uh, folks in the in the movement uh, articulate so well. The other part is uh, sort of where this intersects with the social condition of our people. Uh, this is the reason why uh, the policies that Senator Sanders and others are so passionate about matter. The people who were hit the hardest uh, in any disaster um, are always the folks who aren't making enough money. 
who are living in economically depressed uh, neighborhoods who, if they have a $400 uh, emergency expense, uh, it can send them into a tailspin. And it is um, uh, also important to point out that there is a racial justice element to all of this as well. I mean, uh, the um, overwhelming majority of uh, folks um, who, um, I, I guess I'll say it like this, there's a disproportionate amount of minorities that are represented in low income classes here. Um, and uh, I think many smart people would argue that that is by design and it has, uh, poverty has been perpetuated by uh, racist uh, institutional systems here in America since the beginning uh, of this country. And so if we don't approach all of these challenges with an intersectional lens, if we don't approach these challenges, understanding how um, uh, climate justice must be married with uh, racial and social justice and how raising the minimum wage can lift people out of these economically depressed neighborhoods into areas that are better resourced and all of, uh, all of this is sort of fabric of humanity. If we, uh, if we can't recognize this, um, our solutions to any one of these problems will not be sufficient. And here again, I just got to give a, a plug. This is why uh, your vote matters. This is why electing people to Congress, to the Senate, um, to the highest offices in the land who can, who, who can have these conversations and bring these perspectives into our policy ideation. This is why it all matters uh, right here. And this is why Bridget Williams with Sunrise Cedar Rapids and Tamara Marcus and others uh, with advocates for social justice are on the front lines responding to the people um, who are harmed the most because um, uh, you know other folks uh, tend to forget about them. So I'm glad that there are people like Bridget and Tamara and others um, uh, who haven't forgotten about the folks who need us the most. Okay, the next question comes from Susie from Ames. Susie asks, will there be a full-throated effort to expand the USPS back into limited banking as had been done for many years until it was discontinued? Which would be a way to extend solvency and help those thousands of people in areas that are unbanked or don't have access to a bank? So Susie's asking, would we, would we do this with the USPS? Senator, you wanna take this one? Maybe we can go to Mike. Absolutely. Um in fact, I just spoke to Kirsten Gillibrand, the senator from New York, just the other day, and that's exactly what we talked about. Uh, and as Mike indicated, uh, one of the ways we want to strengthen the Postal Service is to put an end to this disgusting payday lending where desperate working people who may have a medical bill, they can't get credit from a bank, they got to go to a payday lender, and I am not exaggerating, they have to pay two, 300% interest rates for the $1,000 or $2,000 that they borrow. And they never pay it off. They're always paying off the interest. So we can strengthen the U.S. Postal Service by getting them involved in postal banking where people can get modest amounts of loans, where they could deposit their uh, checks, have some accounts, because they're being rejected by big banks today who can't make enough money off of them. Uh, but Mike, I wanted to thank you and the APWU, the American Postal Workers Union, for your support of that concept. It's good for postal workers, it's good for the country, it's good for low-income people. So yeah, we're gonna go forward vigorously uh, for uh, postal banking. Great. Um, on the same subject, uh, let's see. This one is from Stephanie. Stephanie says, hey, I'm, I'm a voter in Iowa, but I'm no longer living in the state. I'm outside of the US right now. How can I support the campaign or how can I be supportive of all the stuff that you are talking about? I'm sure that is sort of similar to folks who are watching all across the country right now. What can folks do who are not in Iowa to support you know, the recovery of Cedar Rapids or some of the other issues we've talked about today? Who would like to take that? I'll start and then and we can um, jump to whoever else wants to, to jump in. I, I listed at the top of, of my remarks um, a few different ways. Um, if you're not here, um, probably the best way is to contribute financially, if you can, to any number of organizations that are helping. 
I mentioned that there are the big uh, organizations we all know about, um, the American Red Cross, uh, the United Way, um, but there are also organizations that are more grassroots in nature and, and justice focused. Um, and that, in my view, would be the Advocates for Social Justice, uh, as well as Sunrise Cedar Rapids. They're doing a lot of good work here. Uh, another thing I'd say is keep this story in the news. Um, talk about us on social media um, and also put pressure on our, our elected officials, Senator Joni Ernst and President Trump, uh, to act. And uh, whenever you have the opportunity to support a progressive that's running for office that is uh, openly supporting a Green New Deal, that is openly uh, supporting a compassionate uh, universal health care plan and all of the other things, a, a living wage, all of the other things that we know are going to help working people, the working poor and the most vulnerable in this country and to actually build an equitable society, please do whatever you can to help those candidates. And I would just add, you know, add that voting, we'll talk a little bit about that in a second, and also, you know, getting involved in local organizations wherever you're at also help all these policy issues that we've been talking about. One last question, I think we're almost here up on time. Uh, this comes from Jessica in Des Moines. I'm a high school teacher in Des Moines and want to know what everyone thinks about schools across the country starting to reopen. Even when it's clearly not safe in many places, what are we, what are we supposed to do as teachers to keep ourselves, our families, and our students safe? Uh, I'll take that one, uh, if that's okay, because I've been working with the, um, the, uh, the union of teachers here in Iowa. I talked earlier about partnering with other unions in the state to address these core issues around COVID-19. Um, and so we're working, we believe that it should be left up to uh, local communities, local school districts. You know best what's best in your community, and you know how um, the rates of COVID infections are um, how they are in your community. So it's really a local decision, but that's been taken away from local authorities that know best what you need for your schools and your students uh, to make that decision whether to go back to classes or not. Um, I think it's really important to know that uh, CCI action, progressive organizations like that and unions, need you can get involved that way because we are working together to actually create change and march. We had protests here in Iowa City on the university campus for the students that are so afraid of um, the COVID-19 pandemic affecting them and their families as they come back to classes. Um, we've seen the cases on our university uh, um, ISU, um, the cases are climbing there. So you know, your voice matters and teachers' voices as much as nurses are extremely important when you're talking about this publicly because we trust you. Um, we're trusted voices in our communities. So speak out if you're concerned, um, get involved with actions in your area. Um, and, you know, that's the, raise your voices on this issue because Iowans truly care about it. I think that about rounds up our, our time for questions. We're going to close out here in just a few minutes. But one of the things I wanted to say is, as we've, we've heard the senator say from way back in 2015 and 2016, change never happens from the top down. It only happens from the bottom up. Uh, so we have a lot of work cut out for us in the next 72 days before one of the most important elections of our lifetime. So um, in Iowa right now, you can register to vote and request an absentee ballot, which is definitely going to be one of the safest ways to vote. So um, you have until October 24th to do that. So register to vote, request your absentee ballot. And we heard Mike, who works with the Postal Service, say, request your ballot now and get it in early. So please do that. And then early voting in the state starts on October 5th and goes until November 2nd. With that, we're going to tell you what you can do to plug in to make the change happen on the ground in Iowa. And then we'll hear some last words from Senator Sanders. So Katie, what can Iowans do? Thanks, Misty. Yeah, so there are so many issues we're dealing with right now. It's easy to feel overwhelmed by it. Uh, many of us often wonder, what do we do about it though? The answer, organize. And CCI is hosting the perfect opportunity to do this. Next Saturday, August 29th, we'll be having our annual convention, Rooted in Justice. We're inviting you to join us because right now, like no other time in the last 50 years, we have an opportunity to make major changes to our economy, our environment, our healthcare system, and our democracy right here in Iowa. But to do it, we need to organize thousands more people, remove politicians who attack the solutions we need, and elect people who share our vision for a healthy and prosperous future. A future that puts people ahead of profit. 
Next weekend's event is a chance to connect, to learn something new, and to get re-energized by righteous energy, love, hope, and collective action. This year's featured speakers, folks from Working Families Party, the Movement for Black Lives, Mi Gente, Heal Food Alliance, and Senator Sanders' own campaign are on the cutting edge of social change work. They'll connect the COVID-19 pandemic with the movement for Black Lives, with the future of our food systems and planet, and talk about the urgency of our fight as we work together to defeat Donald Trump on November 3rd. Use the link on your screen to register to join us. The best part, it's free. And with that, I'd like to kick it back to Senator Sanders to close us out. Well, Katie, uh, thank you very much uh, for the great work you are doing and your call for action. Uh, your call to the people of Iowa and my call to the people of America uh, to come together, uh, to not allow Donald Trump to divide us up, not allow Donald Trump to suppress the vote. When Trump talks about trying to destroy the Postal Service, there is a reason. And that is he does not want you to participate in the political process. Doesn't want you to have a mail-in ballot. And what we have got to say to Donald Trump is that in Iowa, in Vermont, and all over this country, too many people have fought and died for democracy, the right of ordinary people to control the future. And Donald Trump, we're not going to let you destroy that democracy. We are going to vote, and we're going to vote you out of office. And in this moment, as never, ever before, we need to bring people together, not only to elect Joe Biden, not only to elect Democrats to control the Senate and the House, but to create the kind of movement that is prepared to take on the power of Wall Street and the healthcare industry and the military industrial complex and the fossil fuel industry and the prison industrial complex. This country is run by a small number of very, very powerful people. Our job in the next 73 days is to do everything we can to defeat Trump and elect Joe and Kamala as our president and vice president. And the day after we do that, we continue our mobilization of people in the fight for justice. We're the wealthiest country in the history of the world. Don't tell me that a half a million people should be homeless or that half of the working people in this country, including many in Iowa, should be working for starvation wages while the very, very rich get richer. Don't tell me that the United States cannot create millions of jobs leading the world and take it on the fossil fuel industry, transforming our energy system and helping to lead the planet, lead, lead the world in the fight to preserve our planet. We can do those things but we can only do those things when people stand up and fight for justice. And I just want to thank uh, Misty uh, for born and raised in Iowa for helping to uh, organize this event. Uh, Stacy continue to do the great job as Linden County supervisor. Thanks for all you're doing. Let me thank Katie and Kathy and Larry and Bridget and Mike. These are people who are working every day to improve life for the people of Iowa and the people of America. So, Thank, let me thank the panelists again. Let me thank all of you who are watching. The next 73 days are the most important political days in the modern history of this country. We got to work super hard to defeat Donald Trump, elect Joe, and do all the other things that have to be done. So thank you all very much for being with us. Look forward to seeing you again.